Shabbat Shalom. I'm Ford uh, Bicard, uh, and I'm really, really pleased, and I've studied with many of you uh, here in other places in the community. I'm really happy also to have my colleague, Dr. Tom Blanton, uh, who is my good friend and colleague and Chavruta in many ways. Uh, and to some degree, we are representing the TUI Center for Interreligious uh, understanding at John Carroll University. We're both professors in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies. Uh, and uh, given the theme of this Shabbat and given all of the, the broad efforts to try to, in, in many ways, fight hatred and anti-Semitism, excuse me, and hatred in all its forms, um, part of the way I think that, that some people can do that is through deepening understanding of religious others. Uh, and that's really a, a main focus of our department and of the TUI Center uh, in the basic and maybe simple point that if people of one religious tradition or no religious tradition come to understand people of another religious tradition and see how they work and how they tick, they're much less likely to hate them. Uh, and speaking personally for a second, most of my students who take Jewish studies courses at John Carroll are themselves not Jewish, and many of whom have never really encountered other Jews in the world. Uh, and my, my basic hope is that for the rest of their lives, when they grow up and, uh, and encounter Jewish people, Jewish communities, or maybe encounter anti-Semitic ideas, they can say, wait a second, I took a Jewish studies course in college with this weirdo professor. <laughs> he taught me all of these cool things. Learned all of these following things about Jews and Judaism and to have a, uh, a, a sort of deepening understanding of that. So to some degree, what we'd like to do is, is model some of the ways we teach uh, at John Carroll. Uh, and we're going to use today's, uh, today's Parsha, Parshat Noach, as the, uh, as the sort of excuse to model some of the ways we teach at John Carroll. And essentially what we're going to do is do everything but read the biblical text as a biblical text. Uh, and Dr. Blanton uh, is going to go first and, and is going to talk a little bit about Noah before Noah, um, to some degree the, uh, the, the, the religious and cultural ideas to which from a critical historical perspective, the biblical texts are responding. Uh, and afterwards, I'm going to move, jump forward maybe a thousand years in the future from Dr. Blanton's remarks to talk about the way the rabbis uh, in the Talmudic period understand these texts and utilize these texts as a way of thinking about uh, not only Jews and Judaism, but relationships with, with the other. Uh, and uh, uh, so there's a source sheet, at least for my materials going on. There are some uh, some chumashim in case you're totally bored with the things that we're saying. As, as Rabbi Foster will say, it's always good to have a, bring a book to shul. <laughs> quoting you correctly or not. Um, but uh, I think each of us is going to present a little bit. But please, uh, please feel free to, to interrupt. Uh, one of the frustrations... In, in teaching at a Catholic institution is unlike Jewish students, Catholic <laughs> students are sort of uh, acculturized to simply sit and receive and listen to religious instruction. Whereas I think Jewish cultural proclivity is to always argue and ask questions and things like that. Uh, and so I, I don't know how Dr. Blanton feels about this, but I certainly feel more comfortable when people interrupt me um, well, one of the things I, I've learned to do is apologize to my students in advance by telling them I'm going to interrupt you. That's how I demonstrate that I'm listening to you, right? That's how Jews show they're listening is by interrupting each other. That's not the way Northeast Ohio Catholic kids tend to indicate that they're listening. Uh, but in any event, that's that's basically the, the plan for this morning. <clears throat> Dr. Blanton. Thank you, Dr. Bickert, for that very nice introduction. And I also sit right in front. Is it better? Yeah. Maybe, maybe you can bring it closer because you touch these things on Shabbos. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you also to Rabbi Foster and to Rabbi Hal for the invitation for someone to accompany Dr. Bickert here. And he has 
tapped me for this honor. And thank you all for welcoming me and also my wife, May May Lantz. Uh, this is the first time that we've been here and we are super pleased to, to take part today. So thank you all. And uh, on uh, Noah's comment about uh, the Catholic students sometimes uh, constructing themselves as passive vessels uh, to re receive instruction. Well, I had an experience yesterday at teaching a 930 class and the thermostat was set, set to 77 degrees. Yeah. It was very warm. And so, <laughs> so about uh, halfway through the class, I when I asked a question, no one would answer anymore. And then if I pressed them, they, they would just respond, oh, I don't know. <laughs> That's not the way they normally did it. So uh, I'm not sure if, if this is the, the sort of instructional background or if it was the heat or if it was me. Uh, hopefully it was the heat. But OK, so as uh, Dr. Bickert said, we'll talk about Noah before Noah, the flood stories from ancient Mesopotamia. And I will talk about two flood stories from ancient Mesopotamia. One is called the Atrahasis story. Can you hear me well? Not no, well. a little louder. Closer. A little louder. Is, is that better? Can you help me one for the... I think the microphone's only for the uh, steaming. Ah, so just speak Okay, up. then to just speak louder. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just uh, kind of give me a sign if it's loud enough or, or not. Yeah, pl please do that. So uh, I will talk about two ancient flood stories. Uh, the first one is called the Atrahasis Epic. The second one is the more famous Gilgamesh epic. And in both of those, there is a flood and a flood hero, but with two different names. And so we'll talk about the dating of those and give a little summary of both of those. So starting with Atrahasis, in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, present day uh, in between uh, the Tigris and Euphrates River. So the Atrahasis ep epic comes in multiple versions. The oldest one is the old Babylonian version from the 1700s BCE. So pretty old. The oldest copy of that is coming from the 1600s BCE. And Atrahasis, we can point out, means something like extra wise. And so the tablets uh, begin as follows. The sky gods called the Anunnaki, they imposed labor on another category of gods called the Igigi. These Igigi were to dig canals and rivers, including the Tigris and Euphrates. And the canals and rivers were to water the land so that it would be fertile. Deciding that the workload that had been imposed was simply too great, the Igigi gave what may be the most ancient version of a labor strike. And in this case, <laughs> they engaged in armed revolts against the, the sky gods, Anu and Elil, who were leading the sky gods. The wise Ea acts as a mediator between the two classes of gods and suggests that they create primeval man to do the work in place of the Igigi. So uh, hopefully our contemporary labor strikes won't be solved in the same way. We just create something else to replace these striking workers. Maybe it will be AI, I don't know. That remains to be seen, right? Mm -hmm. These are the first scabs, then people are the first scabs. <laughs> exactly, yes. Unfortunately. And so here I quote a bit from the text. Create primeval man that he may bear the yoke. Let him bear the yoke, do the work of Elil. Let man bear the yoke of the gods. So primeval man is created from the flesh and blood of a slain god that was mixed together with clay. And as I was first reading this, I was likening this to Adam, but this is not actually an Adam figure yet. This is an intermediate figure between the gods and the humans. Hmm. So it's a, the, the blood and flesh of a god plus clay. Humans are going to be made of clay. They come next. So first, the, the, the primeval man 
And then come the humans. And I'm actually in the story, it's not exactly clear the relation of the primal man to the humans. But uh, so the humans are created next. And there are seven pinches of clay that are put on the right side of a display and seven pinches of clay put on the left side of a display. And then the, the two sevens are brought together. And these are males and females. So this is the origin of the, the human race uh, in the story. So each of these seven pairs begins to reproduce and the human population starts to grow. The humans rapidly multiply and become very noisy. <laughs> Apparently, they were not Catholic students, <laughs> they were Jewish students. <laughs> and so as a result of this the god elil is saddened because he cannot sleep very well anymore the humans are just too noisy and apparently they're not sleeping and so he can't sleep he wants to rest and so he unleashes a disease and the text calls this shirupu disease do not ask me what disease exactly shirupu is i have no idea but i assume it is deadly because it reduces the population what group um, had the story. So this is in ancient Mesopotamia, ancient to Babylonia. Yeah, so we'll, we'll say this is a Babylonian story. Yeah. Okay. But it's interesting the name Elil, I and mean, we have El. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, similar. And so after 600 years of population growth, uh, the population has uh, become uh, very large so that the, the disease is unleashed, the population is reduced, and then after the reduction, the humans then start to bounce back and their population increases again. And again, they become noisy and start to disturb the gods. And then I quote again from the text, 600 years, less than 600 passed, and the country became too wide, the people too new. Numerous. The country was noisy like a bellowing bull. The gods grew restless at their clamor. Elil had to listen to their noise, and again, he couldn't sleep. So, in this case, he enlists another god, the storm god Adad. And Adad then withholds the rain, and the crops fail. The people respond appropriately by building a huge temple to Adad. Lights not and flashing. The That's lights would be flashing, so I want to turn it off. We continue. Not anymore. The, testing our skills as to how Mute many... Mute yourself on Zoom, please. Not on. None of those are on. So uh, Adad then uh, is brought gift gifts of bread offerings, and the gifts shame him into relenting on withholding the rain. So he lets the rain come back again, and again, the people start to multiply. The gods then respond again by shutting the gates to the canals that irrigated the fields, and another famine ensues. And eventually, we're getting this sort of uh, this pattern of you know, population growth and then population reduction by some kind of divine uh, action. And uh, eventually, the story picks up. Elil orders the gods, and it's going to up the ante this time, to deploy a triple whammy of afflictions to try to reduce the population. This time, it's disease and drought, and they dry up all of the springs. So again, starvation ensues, and apparently there's a, a, a portion missing in the text, but apparently the humans bounce back again, so there's going to be a, a, a better solution to this, and so Elil teams up with the, with the sky god Anu, and they determine to just wipe out the humans by making a gigantic flood in this case, and that will sound a little familiar. And so then the, the narrative skips over to our flood hero, Atrahasis, at that point. And uh, Atrahasis especially reveres a god called Inki. And as a reward for this reverence, Inki forewarns Atrahasis, the gods are trying to kill you. You better make a gigantic ark so that you can escape the flood. 
And soon the flood begins. And so I, I read from the text. Uh, God, the storm, God bellowed from the clouds. When Atrahasis heard the noise, bitumen was brought and he sealed the door to his ark. Adad kept bellowing from the clouds. The winds were raging, even as Atrahasis went up and cut the rope and released the boat. The flood roared like a bull, like a wild ass screaming. The winds howled. The darkness was total. There was no sun. This solution, however, caused another problem. The problem was that in ancient Babylonia, the view was that if the humans did not sacrifice to the gods, they were supposed to sacrifice animals to give them meat. They were supposed to give them a grain and bread offerings, and they were supposed to give them beer. And that is how the gods ate. The gods needed to eat. If the humans quit sacrificing, the gods went hungry. That was a problem, yes? And, and so the gods then begin to respond to that. So the story picks up the goddess Nintu is weeping over the multitude of deceased humans whom she is apparently very fond of. <clears throat> she says there's so many humans washing around after this flood that it's like dragonflies on the Tigris in the late spring or whenever the time dragonflies die, I'm not sure. Uh, and so she's weeping over the humans. Nintu wept and fueled her passions. She was sated with grief. She longed for beer in vain. Where she sat weeping, there sat the great gods too. But like sheep, they could only fill their windpipes with bleeding. Thirsty as they were, their lips discharged only the rhyme of famine. For seven days and seven nights, the torrent, storm, and flood came on. There is another break in the text, but so the text picks back up at this point. The gods smelled the fragrance. They gathered like flies over the offering. So apparently the flood has now withdrawn and Atrahasis has made a sacrifice that is pleasing to the gods and is also feeding the gods. So they are extra interested in that. Uh, this uh, the story comes to a close uh, shortly. Inky uh, then uh, is uh, proposes a compromise uh, after Elil, the god who had unleashed the flood to begin with. Elil is furious that some of the humans had survived the deluge because he wanted quiet. He wanted them them all gone, uh, and so uh, to sort of uh, uh, assuage his anger, Inky proposes a compromise solution. Rather than wiping out all the humans on the one hand, or simply letting them overpopulate and be noisy on the other hand. Uh, he proposed that we should devise some population control methods that would be <laughs> partial. Yes. And so, unfortunately, most of these are missing from the text, but some of them remain. <laughs> and so the, the ones that remain says, let there be one third of the people among the people, the woman who gives birth yet does not give birth successfully. Let there be the Pashitu demon among the people to snatch the baby from its mother's lap. This would be an explanation of uh, child mortality, infant mortality. And then in addition to that, three categories of women to serve in temples were instituted. And then I quote from the text again, they shall be taboo and thus control childbirth. So apparently this group of women serving in temples was supposed to remain celibate and unmarried and childless. <clears throat> and then the text ends uh, at that point. So <laughs> I guess it's supposed to be a happy ending there. There's a compromise. At least there's some humans left, although we have problems. Yeah. I count it as a happy ending anyway. So, And then what, what we go, do, do we have enough time for, for Gilgamesh? Yeah, uh, uh, that one is shorter. So uh, the uh, Gilgamesh epic is actually even older 
than the Atrahasa story. There is a Sumerian version that's coming from 2100 BCE, an old Babylonian version from the 1700s BCE, so that's contemporaneous with the one we just talked about, and the standard Babylonian version, which is the longest, copied by scribes at Nineveh in the 700s and six or 600s BCE. And so the, the, the story is uh, sort of told in passing uh, as part of the larger Gilgamesh epic. And Gilgamesh, uh, towards the end of the story, is searching for uh, immortality because it, his best friend uh, had died and he realizes that he also may die. So he's trying to find a way out of that. Uh, and uh, the only solution he can think of is that he's going to find the one person that he knows of who has become immortal. And this, in this case, is another flood hero it, it, who is named Utnapishtim in the story. And uh, Utnapishtim had been rewarded with immortality after surviving a great flood. And so Gilgamesh is searching for this person. He doesn't actually get his immortality, by the way, but uh, he does get regaled with Utnapishtim's first person account of the Great Flood. So not a, not a bad, you know, door prize. And so Utnapishtim tells the story. It follows the basic storyline of the Atrahasis <laughs> epic. And I just pick up a, a couple of parts here. So Utnapishtim tells how he builds his ark, he covers it with bitumen, and then I quote the text, he loaded her with all the gold, loaded her with the seed of all living things. All of them I put on board, all my kith and kin, put on board cattle from open country, wild beasts from open country, all kinds of craftsmen. Apparently, this ark was spacious. <laughs> yes. And so the, the flood begins, and I will uh, take a look at another uh, excerpt from this, which I think is interesting. So uh, the text reads that for six days and seven nights, the wind blew, the flood and tempest overwhelmed the land. When the seventh day arrived, the tempest, flood, and onslaught, which had struggled like a woman in labor, blew themselves out. The sea finally became calm. The winds grew quiet. The flood held back. And then uh, again, uh, Utnipish team speaking. I looked at the weather and silence reigned for all mankind had returned to clay. I opened a porthole in the ark and light fell on my cheeks. I bent down, I sat, I wept. Tears ran down my cheeks. I looked for the banks, for limits to the sea. Areas of land started to emerge everywhere. The boat had come to rest on Mount Nemush, and the boat remains resting on this mountain for seven days. When the seventh day arrived, I put out and released a dove. The dove went, it came back, for no perching place was visible to it, and it turned around. I put out and released a swallow. The swallow went, it came back, for no perching place was visible to it, and it turned around. I put out and released a raven. The raven went and saw the waters receding. It ate, preened, lifted its tail, and did not turn around. Then I put everything out to the four winds, and I made a sacrifice. I set out an offering upon the mountain peak, arranged seven and seven jars. Into the bottom of them I poured the essences of reeds, pine, and myrtle. The gods smelt the fragrant the fragrance. The gods smelt the pleasant fragrance. The gods, like flies, gathered over the sacrifice. And then at that point, uh, uh, there arrives uh, Belit Ili, the mistress of the gods, and this will bring this to a close. And she then comments on the entire sequence of events. She says, Behold, O gods, I shall never forget the significance of my lapis lazuli necklace. And I'm not quite sure the significance of the necklace here, but she says, I shall remember these times I shall never forget. 
let other gods come to the offering, but let not Elil, who had unleashed the flood, come to this offering because he did not consult before imposing the flood and consigned my people to destruction. And that brings us to, to the close of, of, of the, the story there. So in summary, we have uh, two flood heroes, one Atrahasis, extra wise, and the other one, Utnipishtim, uh, which means he found life. And I would simply raise the question, as uh, Dr. Bickard already alluded to, uh, to what extent can we see connections between uh, this narrative and the Hebrew Bible narratives? And if we do see connections, what does that tell us, if anything, about the religious other and how closely we might be related to that other? Yeah, thank you. A couple questions. Um, is there archaeological evidence of a big flood in that area um, sometime, I guess, the, the earliest state? Yeah. As far as I'm aware, there is no archaeological evidence of a worldwide flood ever. Yeah. But, However, but well, one of my students a couple of years ago did write a really good paper uh, that there is a plenty of archaeological evidence for periodic flooding in between the Tigris and Euphrates. Mm. And so that's probably what they have in the backs of their minds here. Uh, so the, the, the inundation would, uh, would cover the area in some places between the Tigris and Euphrates. So that would be, for all intents and purposes, a great flood, although not the sort of worldwide flood that's imagined in the stories. People didn't know how big the world was either. That is also a good point. Uh, where is Nineveh and, and the mountain you mentioned, uh, do we know where that is? Uh, here, I think you are testing me beyond my capacity <laughs> to answer. Uh, I, I assume that the that the mountain is not a real mountain, but I could be wrong about that. I, I was just looking at a picture of an ancient Babylonian map uh, the other day, mm -hmm. and it, it was this, there's a little round circle with uh, uh, Babylonia in the middle, and then uh, the names of a few other neighbors sort of on the periphery, and then there is apparently a bitter river that that encircles the entire earth as far as they knew it. And then beyond that, there are like eight rows of mountains sort of arranged compass like around the edge. Uh, and so I, I really, I don't know sort of where they're envisioning this as taking place if given that ancient view. And where's Nineveh? And what someone will know this. I do not remember where on the map Nineveh is. It was in Syria. Syria. Yeah, it's in Syria. Yeah. Sort of in Syria. Due north of what we would imagine contemporary Israel being, essentially. Your question from Toronto. Uh, what is the significance of the common theme of <clears throat> incense to please the one god or the many gods yeah. incense yeah the the pleasing odor um th this one was curious to me because uh on the one hand when i had read uh, the the older the version of the story that didn't tell what the sacrifice was i had always assumed that it was an a meat sacrifice because what could be better than that? But uh, in, in, in the, the epic that, that I just read, the Gilgamesh epic, it's some kind of, of scents of things like that are in pots, like pine resin. Hmm. And so uh, I, I don't know if that's related to incense, uh, and that's why they're smelling it. Uh, but uh, uh, probably a, a, another way to answer that would be that uh, even in, uh, in in Tanakh, right, you, you can have this idea of, of sacrifices giving off a good smell, and it's a pleasing odor, right, uh, pleasing to the Lord. Uh, so everyone likes the good scent, and presumably, especially if it is related to some good food being cooked up, uh, right? I just have a comment. It's not really a question. I, I was just interested in the fact that both of those stories, uh, the number seven is prominent, and it's also prominent in our stories. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. and so so there's probably some connection there. I think that uh, the the sevens that we're getting in Genesis are related to responding to the sevens that we're getting in Babylonia. And th th this has been a question of, of, for me for a while. Wh why seven? Where is that coming from? And my, my tentative answer to that at this point is that it's related to lunar cycles. Mm -hmm. So yet you have lunar cycles of uh, 29 uh, to 31 days. And if you were to break that basically it, it into quarters, the closest you can get to quartering that is in sevens. And so uh, uh, that is my guess that that's the significance of the sevens. Uh, it may also be related uh, to seven visible heavenly bodies uh, at that point, too. Yeah. You, you mean the planets? Uh, planets, including a sun and moon. Yeah. I, well, I do know, and I've studied quite a bit of astronomy, and I've studied the stuff. And what we never talked about was what happened before that. What happened in in Asia, in um, China and all, they, I think, have even older stories, if I'm not mistaken. We never hear about them, mm -hmm. but they seem to have had a very, very old civilization there. And, and again, here you, you are exceeding my knowledge base because I cannot answer at, at all about what's going on uh, in, in China at that point. But this morning I was having the same thought because uh, is that some of the texts will, will say that, uh, that the oldest sort of city he built the oldest building of very large scale cities uh, was occurring in uh, Turkey and Mesopotamia um, in around 5000 BCE. Uh, and after that, and so it, especially in the Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh epic, uh, there is an emphasis on uh, living in the city versus living in the country. And, and you can think of the, the Tower of Babel story. There is a city where they're building this gigantic tower. Uh, so income inequality increases in cities, but you can also get large building projects done. But, uh, uh, you know, I also had the exact same thought this morning. I don't know what's happening in places like China. Are they not getting a huge city? Cities built at that point, like it, it, it or are, it, is our knowledge base that, uh, that that we're sort of reading from in Near Eastern studies and in Western Asia studies is that just limited and regional? And so I, I don't have the answer to that. Africa, for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. In the, <laughs> so please, yeah. In the Hebrew Bible, God brings the flood because there's. Uh, he's frustrated with the human race at that time. They're they're uh, immoral. They're they're violent. They're you know they're maybe aware of their mortality and they're they're seeking glory in other ways. You know to uh, you know to deal with that. Uh, it, uh, uh, but basically, there's chaos, and he wants to wipe them out is there is this a note that uh, you see uh, in in these other tales yeah, so an interesting point that uh, God looks upon the humans and sees only wickedness, right? <laughs> and so he is sorry that he had created them and decides to blot them out. Yeah, and so the, the sort of motive clause is very different in, in Genesis than it is in, in these other stories. So it's in the, the other stories, it is the, some of the gods want to sleep, right? Versus that sort of... I, ideas of, of uh, immorality, uh, wickedness, uh, murder, etc. So um, it does become sort of an interesting thought experiment if you, you posit that these older texts are in the background and that Genesis is somehow responding to those, then they are certainly uh, completely switching around the motive to, to make it probably re related in some way to potentially legal observance. Uh, you know, how do you define what wickedness is? Well, you, you must not be uh, obedient to the law in some way. Yeah, so uh, I, I think that does open up sort of new questions and new ways to, to add layers of meaning into the biblical text by putting it into conversation. 
And uh, it seems in the other stories there's a, a strong element of polytheism, multiple gods, and then the Hebrew text it shifts to monotheism, one god. What's your thinking around that shifting? Because that to me seems like one of the biggest distinctions. Mm -hmm. Because there's there seems to be lots of other detailed parallels, mm -hmm. but the monotheism and the poly polytheism mm -hmm. are different distinctions. Yeah, so, so that would be another nice question that arises only when you put these texts into conversation with one another. And so uh, one thing that, that I always uh, reiterate to my students in class, especially in my New Testament classes where we're reading about Greco-Roman religion, is that you can't actually understand your biblical text unless you understand what the neighbors are doing. <laughs> And it's really putting these things into conversation that it g gives you levels of meaning and nuance that you wouldn't have picked up on before. For example, this difference of motivation clauses. Why did the flood occur in the first place? But then the, the, this question of, of, uh, of polytheism versus uh, something that might be called monotheism is also an interesting one. And uh, it would probably we could talk about that and have an entire class on that. But uh, my, my short take is that uh, there is a sort of precursor to what we're getting in, in, uh, in, in Tanakh already in, uh, the, in ancient Babylonia, although you had many gods and goddesses that are showing up in the narratives in uh, the, the uh, the Gilgamesh, no, not the Gilgamesh epic uh, in, what, what is the story I read in my class, the first thing, even before Gilgamesh epic, no, no, no actually knows my syllabus better than I do. Apparently not. The, the, <laughs> the, the name of the story is escaping me, but uh, it ends with, with a praise to Marduk. And, and so the, you can sort of hierarchize and prioritize certain gods over others, even in a polytheistic milieu. And re re remember from the flood stories that uh, Atrahasis uh, especially likes uh, Inki, this god, and so it tips him off uh, that the flood is coming. And so that sort of the special attachment to a particular god then it would be something that would be well known, even in a polytheistic context. And that becomes sort of magnified, I, I think, in, in, in Hebrew Bible, where the, 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 the Lord becomes the, the God, the only God that should be worshipped, right? Uh, that said, I don't think we have exactly monotheism yet uh, in, in this Tanakh, uh, and it, we can remember that in the Genesis creation stories, there are th these uh, first person plural cohortatives, let us make mankind. Uh, in our own image. So there's this idea that there is some multi multiplicity of divine beings who should be uh, doing things by consensus in some way. And this is actually what gets Elil into trouble in the Atrahasis epic because he unilaterally made a flood. Like when he gets chastised at the end, the chastisement is he did this without consulting anyone. <laughs> Right, and so even uh, God in the Hebrew Bible apparently knows how to consult. Let us make man. Let us go down and confuse the languages of the people uh, at, at Babel. Right? Yes. Yeah, so it's him is plural. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to exercise a little prerogative. I want to look a little bit at the rabbinic text. We have to be out of here by ten o'clock. So let me just bracket questions for a second, and we'll try to get to them after we look at some of the rabbinic texts. So, uh, so drawing on some of the things Tom has said, of course, is that the rabbis of the Talmud, now thousands of years in the future, seem to have an eye towards this story in Parshat Noach and notice this notion that God's punishing of humanity must be exactly as Dr. Blanton said, as a result of some kind of failure to live up to uh, a proper behavior and see the flood and its aftermath as a opportunity for God to create a kind of universal covenant. And this is something obviously the rabbis are really, really interested in because they read the Torah as primarily a law code. And moreover, a law code for Israel as opposed to the rest of the world. This is among the things that shocks my students because unlike 
most Christianities, and certainly under unlike Islam, Judaism is not a universal religion. That is to say, in the idealized world, right, in the perfected world of messianic times, not everybody has to convert to Judaism in that famous line from Isaiah that uh, that in, in, in the future times, all peoples will come to Jerusalem and offer at the temple. Those other peoples don't lose their other identities. They don't convert to Judaism. They maintain their otherness in some ways while acknowledging that the Jews are right. And that makes that makes it very, very different. And so the rabbis, therefore, have a question, which is where if not everybody has to be Jewish, where do these ideas of a kind of universal covenant come from? And the rabbis of the Talmud really point to our parasha as the, as the place where this happens, assuming that if the flood is in some ways a do-over of creation, that when <clears throat> Noah and Noah's family emerge from the ark, they must get this universal covenant. And that's the first source on your sheet. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start at, at verse four. You must not, however, eat flesh with its life, but in it, if you remember back to Genesis three, what are the first human beings allowed to eat? Plants. They're supposed to be vegetarians, okay? This makes the vegetarians among us very happy. Unfortunately, after the flood narrative, it seems like as a concession to human weakness in verse five, right? But for your own lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. I will require it of every beast of man too, okay? That, that human beings are now allowed to eat meat. However, and I just want to switch to the Hebrew because this is among the most artfully written verses in all human literature ever. Okay. It's a palindrome. It's a perfect palindrome. Hmm. Tr translating it, therefore, is hard because it's poetic. But something like, whoever spills the blood of a person, right, that person's blood will be spilt by another person. In other words, sort of what well, measure for measure. If you go around being violent, violence will come upon you. Right? That there are consequences for violence, and this is a, a really a universal value. If you look at the second source, this the great Rabbi Akiva sort of raises the stakes here. Shofech dam ha'adam ba'adam damo yishafech, quoting this verse, Darash Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva said, Kol mi shehu shofech damim ma'alim alav ki ilu hu mima'et et atam demuk. Anybody who kills another person, who spills another blood, spills blood, it's not only that they've got something coming to them, but it's as if they've shrunken God, that the offense, violence against other human beings is as if it were violence against God. How does Rabbi Akiva make this move? Well, he's Rabbi Akiva, so he knows the rest of the verse. He quotes the second half, right? This Midrash asked why? Right? Why is it that he reads it this way? Because the second first is Ki Elohim Asa et Adam. Because human beings are made in the divine image, and therefore violence against human beings is violence against God. Okay, so maybe drawing upon some of the comments and the things we've been talking about, the sort of among the differences between Genesis and these other pre-existing stories is this kind of moral claim that you have to do, you have to behave properly, otherwise bad things will happen to you, right? Rabbi Akiva is almost raising the stakes even more that when human beings behave terribly to other people, there aren't only human consequences, but they're divine consequences as well. Okay, so that's one thing. Ancient, the, the rabbis are not the only ones, or maybe not even the first ones, to have read this story as a kind of universal covenant. There's a very interesting book, the Book of Jubilees. It exists only in Ethiopic, in Ge'ez, preserved as scripture only in the Ethiopic Christian church. 
um, but which preserves many, many uh, early interpretations of Genesis, which speaking of parallels, and as Dr. Blanton said, you can't understand a text unless you understand the other ideas in the context in which that text is being created. So Jubilees understands that after the flood narrative, and this is the third source here, right? And in the 28th Jubilee, speaking of sevens, okay, Jubilees is all about sevens and seven times seven, not for now. Noah began to enjoin upon his sons the ordinances and commandments and all the judgments that he knew. And these are the commandments, according to Jubilees, to observe righteousness, sort of confusing exactly what that is, to cover the shame of their flesh, got to wear clothing. Speaking of Greco-Roman society, right? Among the thing, anybody know what a, a gymnasium means? What is gymnos in Greek? Means nakedness, okay? That the Greeks would exercise naked, you know, discus and shot put, and and among the strangest things for the Greeks was that the Jews had this very particular mode of body modification that they did to their penises, which made them very very strange, which is among the core marks of Judaism to this day. To bless their Creator, to honor father and mother, and love their neighbor and guard their souls from fornication and uncleanliness and all I iniquity. For owing to these things, three things, came the flood upon the earth. Okay, so it's already in Jubilees, this notion that failure to live up to some kind of divine covenant was the cause for the flood. Uh, and therefore, Noah, as a result, is creating this universal kind of system of morality. Maybe even we would call it religious, so that, that's a little bit of an anachronism. So clearly, when the Tosefta, the next to last text on, your, uh, on the first side of the sheet, the Tosefta is really the second rabbinic text created. It's almost at the same time of the Mishnah, but just a little bit later. It says as follows. Al Sheva mitzvot nitztavu b'nei Noach. There were seven commandments given to the children of Noah. Laws. It's very frustrating because not unlike Jubilees, Josephus doesn't tell us what this legal system is supposed to be. And later rabbis will argue whether or not this has to be the same kind of legal system that Jews have. Right, just read Bava Metzia or Exodus chapter 21, right? Or is it supposed to be the Jewish system of laws or any system of laws? Unclear. A prohibition against idolatry, a prohibition against cursing God, blasphemy, a prohibition against forbidden sexual relationships. Again, the question is raised, is this the same list of forbidden sexual relationships in, in, in Leviticus 18 and 20 or a different set? We don't know. Bloodshed. Referring back to Rabbi Akiva, theft, and maybe most confusingly, consuming the limb of a living animal. Okay? Almost nobody does this today. Most people around the world kill animals before they eat them. Uh, although we could come up with a couple of, uh, of examples of such a thing. I think the, the one that, that is foremost in my mind is what's known as Rocky Mountain Oysters, right? Um, which are bull testicles, right? That, that bull, now an ox, is still walking around someplace, and yet its testicles are being consumed by somebody. This would be a violation of one of these, one of these principles. Okay, now, uh, uh, just looking at the Talmud very briefly, at the last uh, source on the page, the rabbis first quote, the rabbis of the Talmud quote this Tosefta. Okay? And if you turn the page for a second, ask a very good question. They say, where in the Bible are these laws enumerated? It would have been lovely for us to see that when Noah gets off the earth, earth, ark, God says to Noah, okay, I got seven commandments for you and let me enumerate them. But you know, if we were to go in and hear the Torah reading today, you wouldn't hear it explicitly. So the Talmud asks, it's very nice, Tosefta, you tell me that there are these seven laws. Where, where are they in the Bible? Where do they come from? So Rabbi Yochanan answers this question, or at the very least is presented as answering this question. And very interestingly, he does not point to a verse from our parasha about Noah. But Rabbi Yochanan seems to assert these seven 
though associated with Noah after the flood, were actually given to the first human being. And this sort of draws on this notion that it was the failure to live up to these seven laws that caused the flood in the first place. So he quotes the verse from Genesis 2, Vaitzav Hashem Elohim al Adam, God commanded, and you could see probably why Rabbi Yochanan is so invested in this, because it's commandments, very Jewish notion, Lemor, saying as follows, Mikol Eitz Hagan, Achol Tochel. Right? From all of the vegetables of the garden, back to what I said earlier, that initially we're talking about vegetarianism, God commands the human beings, you can eat all of the, from all of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Okay? Is it possible that there just was not enough plants and grass for the, for the humans to eat, and therefore then they went to the animals? I mean, you have to get the idea of eating. But for Rabbi Yochanan, remember, and this is how Midrash works, this is a wonderful introduction to Midrash if you need one. And the metaphor I love to use with my students is the Midrash works as follows. The rabbis read the Bible as if every verse, every, every word, word is blue and underlined, right? And for those of you who use the World Wide Web, you get this metaphor that if I were to click on any given word, all of the other instances of that word immediately pop up. Right, they're not doing it on a computer screen, they're doing it in their brains, but that's how it works. Vaitzav, he commanded. So commandments, Rabbi Yochanan says, these are dinim, these are the laws. This is quoting a verse about Abraham, right? Where that same word that Abraham will command his children to do all these laws, therefore commandment means laws. Shem, God's name, that means don't curse God. Right? Uh, Elohim, that means don't do idolatry. Because, of course, in the Ten Commandments, it says, don't have other Elohim acherim al panai, don't have other gods. Uh, and eventually we have um, lo, uh, uh, al ha'adam, he commanded this is given to man, that means don't kill human beings because of the verse I quoted before, shofech dam ba'adam, if you kill another human being, therefore this means don't spill blood, okay? Um, and, uh, and as follows as follows. In other words, Rabbi Yochanan uses this verse about Adam to tease out these seven laws from the Noahides. And, and finally, just looking at Maimonides' understanding of this, okay, Maimonides, now we're yet another thousand years in the future, Maimonides insists, and this will sort of show very clearly what I was trying to say before, Moshe Rabbeinu, lo hinchil ha-Torah v'hamitzvot el Yisrael. Torah and the commandments are a Jewish-only phenomenon. Judaism is not a universal religion in this sense. However, okay, someone who does not desire to accept the Torah and commandments should not be forced to. Maimonides insists that trying to compel other people to convert to Judaism is a violation of Judaism. Not everybody needs to be Jewish. And... By the same regard, Moses was commanded by the Almighty to compel all the inhabitants of the world to accept the commandments given to Noah's descendants. If one does not accept these commandments, he should be executed. A person who formally accepts these commands is called the resident alien, etc. Okay, and maybe uh, just looking at, at, at law number 11 for a second, and this is very important. Kol HaMekabel Sheva Mitzvot, anybody, any human being, who accepts these seven commandments and is precise in their observance is considered one of the chasidei umot ha'olam, one of the righteous from among the nations. Uh, and most later authorities are very, and Maimonides among them, is very clear about this, in part because Maimonides lives in a world in which he knows 
both Christians and Muslims in the Egyptian world in which he's writing this. And he can see, he thinks in many ways that Christians and Muslims are wrong about theological matters. But because he asserts that Christians and Muslims alike accept these seven commandments, that they are considered the righteous of among the, the people of the world. Uh, and so I think it's not, it's not without its problematic elements, uh, but this is a very, very important feature, which is to say that according to Judaism, one does not need to be Jewish in order to be considered righteous. <laughs> Uh, and that we, and I think to sort of convert this to the American situation, we live with and among other people who are good moral people to adopt this kind of formulation, who accept these universal commandments. Uh, and therefore, we need to resist any kind of Jewish supremacy that suggests the Jews are somehow better than other people in some ways, that there is a kind of commonality to all human beings on earth, and that to the degree to which human beings live up to these universal values, Jews must consider non-Jewish people who live up to those universal values as righteous human beings. Uh, and I think the hope, in part, uh, for saying these kinds of things is also to demonstrate to our friends and neighbors uh, that despite our differences, which are real and shouldn't be minimized, and despite the fact that Jewish communities wish to live our own deeply Jewish lives, we're also, our religion deeply commits us to a sense of universal morality and justice um, and to a rejection of a kind of moral hierarchy. Uh, and to refer back very briefly to what Rabbi Akiva says, that any time human beings uh, engage in violence against other human beings, even when they have to, uh, that in some sense that limits godliness in the world. Uh, and that, that ought to be very much at the forefront uh, of our minds. What time is it? Oh, we have about two minutes for questions. Please. Uh, the terms Hashem yes. versus I don't know I, right. Elohim. Elohim. Hashem is a, a proper name applied to Jews. In other words, God, the Jewish people know God as Hashem. It means the name, correct? Well, it's a very complicated idea. We should probably save this question for Parshat Shmot. Uh, where uh, where Moses is instructed uh, in this name, the biblical sources themselves disagree uh, as to when God's proper four letter name Yud Hey Vav Hey becomes known. Uh, you're absolutely right that uh, come into being in, in Genesis. Well, as you see from this text, uh, uh, among the strange things in Genesis, Genesis one seems to refer to God as Elohim. Genesis 2 refers to God as yud heh vav -Hey Elohim. Uh, and this is one of the ways in which source critics try to look at the seams of the biblical text and assign these to different pre-existing uh, pre um, sources. I will just note that if you look, if we skip ahead to Parshat Shmot and we see God instructing Moses about God's name, it's very clear that God's four-letter name, while being a personal name, is also very much related to the verb to be, existence. And so, and, and this is exactly how the Septuagint translates this as on, where we get words like ontology and things like that from. Uh, and so while this is God's personal specific name that maybe Jews have some connection to in a special way, it is also much bigger than that and encompasses all of, uh, all of creation and all of existence. And I think that's a very nice way of, of modeling in some ways the fact that Jews insist on a kind of particularism but that particularism is in many ways balanced by a kind of universality in many other ways. So this is, uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm very much aware that there's another program beginning now at 10 o'clock. So the fact that there are other questions, it's a good thing. I doubt the Messiah will arrive before <laughs> Parshat Noach next year. So let's bracket the following uh, uh, questions until we come around at this point in the cycle. Thanks everybody and Shabbat Shalom.